Savannah Bananas. Yes, we're the first team ever named after a fruit. I do all types of events, parties, business casual, weddings. We teach low income and minority students about how to obtain corporate and high income careers. This is the first NFT business period. I'm Jesse Cole. My name is DJ Sophia. My name is Joshua Pierce. My name is Kevin Tall. And I'm Andy Wynn. And this, this is, is My Hustle. hustle. The growth from last year to this year, astronomical, right? So we're in partnership with AT&T, we're with Warner Media, JP Morgan Chase, HSBC, Versace, Michael Kors, Jimmy Choo, Viacom, Nickelodeon, it's just so many brands. And these companies are committed to making a difference for low income and minority students, and we're incredibly happy to be working with them. Even though your days are crazy, you're putting in so much work, you're seeing that you're changing the lives of these students who don't have access to so much opportunities. That just makes it worthwhile. We teach low income and minority students about how to obtain corporate and high income careers. Because the goal is for us to be able to help students who are less fortunate be able to get an equal opportunity and success. We're old enough to really understand the corporate experience. We work with the biggest companies in the world, but we also are young enough to really understand Gen Z culture. Like we know the music we're listening to. So we are them. We are the corporate environment, but we're also the youth and we're able to bring them together in a way that's authentic to both communities. My name is Joshua Pierce. I'm a music artist and I'm also the CEO of the diversity organization. First and foremost, we do research on some of the schools who are the poorest in the country, and we reach out to them, we connect with the decision makers at the school. So these are, you know, principals, assistant principals, and we connect with them, we tell them more about our program, how it can really help enrich everything that they already have going on in the school. My name is Joshua Pierce. I am the CEO of the Diversity Organization. I created it when I was younger. We partner with some of the biggest companies on earth. And unfortunately in this country, if you didn't have a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or somebody like that in your family or a guardian who works at a really big company, it's hard for you guys to be able to get success. Have y'all ever heard of the term, it's not what you know, it's who you know, yeah? The most important thing to remember when we're trying to uplift students is remember it can't be one and done. We have to be able to continuously engage with students to be able to make the impact that we really want to see. I work on our corporate side, so I work with all our multi-billion dollar clients, but Maisha, the president of Global High School Partnerships, she is the one who really engages with the school, uh, works with their administration, and really I just show up and educate the students about what we are, you know, what we do and how we can help them, but she's really the one who is in charge of that relationship. So my responsibilities at the company include connecting the schools and their students with the multi-billion dollar companies that we work with so that the students are able to build their professional skills and have an equal shot at success. Are you ready? Two, one, two, one, two, one. I'm not from here, I'm from this small underdeveloped country called Bangladesh. So I decided pretty early on that, okay, if I'm gonna do what I gotta do, I have to go to the US. I went up to this teacher, my English teacher, who I really, really look up to, and I was just excited to share with her. She told me, Maisha, you're a brown Muslim woman. Those are identities that are not accepted in the US. You're gonna be unwanted and unsuccessful there. It made me really upset and I wanted to go even more. So when I was in high school, I decided to just apply to a bunch of, you know, US schools. So that's what I did. I got into NYU. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so Joshua and Maisha's energy were beautiful to like hear their testimonials really showed us that like, we can work up ahead towards some things and that we don't have to be a product of our circumstances. The average black and Latinx American has about 10 to $15,000 in wealth. And the average white American has over $100,000 in wealth. If you want to be successful, right, there's a huge gap in wealth right now. And how many people think that we should all, black, white, Asian, Latinx, that you should be able to get success? Let me hear you say success. 
Okay, so that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to get you guys those opportunities. Maisha told us her story, which really had people excited when we found out that she came from Bangladesh, went to NYU, she went to Columbia. Yeah, Joshua also go to NYU when he had like a 1.7 GPA, got it up to 3.6. You know, I'm just going to get a haircut, normal 10th, 11th grader. And my barber says to me, Joshua, the road that you're going down and who you're hanging around, you're gonna be in front of 7-Eleven asking people for a dollar. So that really just changed my whole perspective. And I was like, dang, I really need to like step up my game. Like you know, my mom been telling me, my family been telling me, it's time to really take my life seriously. Then I realized the importance of education. My mom says to me, Joshua, you're a black man in the United States. There's only so far you can go without a real education or you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough for you. So I said, you know, Mama knows best. Got into community college, and that's where I started the diversity organization. And thousands of students got really activated about it, and they really started to love it, and they started to blow up really at that community college. I said, hey, if it could blow up at this community college, it can blow up in different schools. Let me see if it'll work. And that's exactly what happened. I played every role from being able to reach out to schools, to reaching out to some of the biggest companies in the world, to being able to be denied. There was a lot of challenge to get here, but now we're helping students all over the planet. So it, 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 was, a, it was a long time coming. We're gonna tell you exactly how you can start working with these companies literally this week. Let's go. Okay, so Global Doers, that is our exclusive student community. So students who work with us, that's what we call them. We call them our global doers because as y'all have been chanting, they just do more. Exactly. Now, what does that mean? So this is our exclusive gr group of students globally who we connect with multi-billion dollar companies. So you get to meet people who work at these really large companies and really build your professional skills. And not only that, you're not just engaging with adults, you also get to connect with other students all across the globe who are just as cool as you, just as determined as you. I wanna show you the dedication that we have to Blackstone. As you see, my environment is a little bit different. We're currently in a school right now in the Bronx. Uh, we're having a bunch of events with them, getting hundreds of students in our program. And um, I was like, hey, I'm not missing this Blackstone meeting. I'm not postponing this meeting. So I asked them, can I have one of the rooms to be able to just take them a few meetings? So just wanted to let you know, that you might hear some noise, you see a change of environment. That is the reason why. I'm on a journey right now to do 100 hour weeks so that I can really achieve a significant growth for our organization. So I'm waking up 6.30, getting to work at seven, working all day. Obviously is a lot of work for the diversity organization and expanding our footprint globally with some of the biggest companies in the game. But um, really what I care about a lot, of course, is family and music. My goal for 2022 is to be able to be just as successful in music as I am as an executive. Because I know that you can really influence the youth if you are in a creative in this space, but also someone who is influential from an executive standpoint. You go talk to somebody who's young, you ask them, hey, name 10 politicians, name 10 CEOs. They may not be able to do that. You ask them to name 10 artists, they'll name you 20. Life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. There's gonna be a lot of challenge. There were six years where we weren't even over 10K in the bank. And now, we're working with the biggest companies in the world. We are not even at 1% of where we're headed, you know? We have really been able to create such a strong presence in the United States. The next step is to take it global. So what my hustle means to me, it means to me my purpose. Those things are the same, right? So whether you're hustling and you're working a job that is, you're struggling and you don't love it, but you know that hustle is gonna help you reach your purpose to support your family or to support your dream or to support your other hustles, your hustle gotta be some way related to your purpose. And when you realize that, you can really find fulfillment in whatever you do. Coming up next. We take more chances, we experiment more, we push the fun envelope more than anyone else in sports. Savannah Bananas, yes, we're the first team ever named after a fruit. We take more chances, we experiment more, we push the fun envelope more than anyone else in sports. Um, 
ESPN called us the greatest show in baseball. I hope that one day we can be the greatest show in sports. And that's why every night you'll see crazy hitting entrances, scoring celebrations, dances, things that people never should see on a ball field, but that's what we do. I'm Jesse Cole, and I'm the owner of the Savannah Bananas. So this is my yellow tux, and this is my uniform. Whenever I wear it, it's showtime. And so I own seven of these and I wear them almost all the time. I proposed to my wife in this yellow tux in front of a sold out crowd. She actually said yes, and we're still married. And this is something that I'm really proud of, and I feel like it gives our team permission to have fun. If they're crazy owners wearing a yellow tuxedo, why can't we all just have a little bit more fun as well? Savannah Manas began in 2015. My wife and I had bought an expansion franchise to join the Coastal Plain League, and we decided it would be a smart move to go from zero debt to over seven figures in debt. It was myself, Emily, our 24-year-old team president, Jared, and when we showed up, we had a big vision for the team, but the ballpark wasn't really ready for that vision when we arrived. People just didn't understand what this was, and so you had a bunch of young people who weren't from Savannah, Georgia, trying to go out and explain to people, hey, we're the new team, we're gonna have you know dancing players, and we're gonna have all-you-can-eat food, and we're gonna have all these you know ridiculous things, and people were just not responsive to it. When we came to Savannah, we didn't have the intention to be the bananas. We wanted to be something completely different, outrageous, unique, and fun. This was after we only sold a handful of tickets in our first few months and we actually overdrafted our account, and my wife and I had to sell our house, empty out our savings account, and we were sleeping on an airbed. We were in the worst possible spot you could be in when starting a team. Truly, our only marketing plan was, we've got to come up with a name, but we've got to have something that speaks fun. So we went to Savannah and said, we need a name of the team, but we need something different, unique, and outrageous. And so we got completely normal and generic names, over 900 of them, except for one. Lynn Moses, a 62-year-old retired nurse, suggested bananas. And we all looked at each other and said, whoa. That could be it. And on February 25th, 2016, with our logo and our name, came into existence, and that was what really got people's attention. Somehow we convinced enough people to come out to opening night that we sold out opening night. Now, we were playing in green uniforms because we weren't quite ripe and we played terrible. We actually made six errors. It was brutal. There was a rain delay. The game didn't start till 8.30. I had the Banana Nanas dance on the field in the rain, which was very funny to watch. We tried everything, and I looked up into the crowd, and not one fan had left. People were in banana costumes. One guy shaped his beard like a banana and painted it yellow. There were banana accessories. People were like, we're gonna give this a shot. Nationally, it went viral. Number one trending on Twitter, People from all over the country and the world trying to reach out to us and buy merchandise, which we had no idea what we were doing. We were charging $5 shipping to send to Australia and the UK. We were literally losing our shirts every step of the way. Since that first season, we've sold out every single game, over 4,000 fans, and now our wait list is over 60,000 for tickets. And my wife and I are sleeping on a real bed, so it's really come full circle. To many people, the Savannah Bananas should not exist. I mean, you can't name any of our players. We have no ads at our ballpark at all. Literally two weeks before the pandemic, we said we're getting rid of all of our advertising, no sponsorship, because we don't believe anyone comes to a ballpark to be sold to, marketed to, or advertised to. Every one of our tickets is all-inclusive. You come to our ballpark, all your burgers, hot dogs, chicken sandwiches, soda, water, popcorn, dessert, everything is included for $20. And there's no ticket fees, no convenient fees, no parking fees, and we pay your taxes. It's a ridiculous business model. You really only have a business if people are willing to, to come and support it and pay for it and talk about it to their friends and post about it on social media. And we will take building fans for the long term over short term profits. Thankfully, you know, now we have over 4 million social media followers and people coming from all over the world to see this little small team in Savannah play baseball. From day one, our goal has been simple. It's to make baseball fun. Everything we do, we put the fans first and try to entertain always. And we just saw there was a challenge in baseball. To many people, it was too long, too slow, and too boring. And we felt there was an opportunity to really make the game fun. The beauty of that is we can literally do anything we want. And that freedom, I don't think really exists in any other sports team, any other property, any other league here we really have the ability to foster as much creativity as our own minds and, and output allows. We're most compared to the Globetrotters with this. However, there's a big difference. 
Well, there's two big differences. The Globetrotters travel with 30 people. We travel with 120. We bring the pep band, the male cheerleading team, the breakdancing coaches, the players and stilts. We bring everybody. Also, you never know who's going to win. The Globetrotters play a game. They always win. Bananas lost four games on this last tour. Five, actually. Because every game is competitive to the end. It's a show. You know, we have over 100 different things in our script, 50 in the pregame alone. And what we're trying to do is put on this choreographed script of show business meets baseball. And well, many people say it's a, a circus and a baseball game breaks out. And I think that's what happens here in Banana Land. Players have to be the right fit to play in Banana Land. You have to be an entertainer and you have to be a baseball player. You have to be very good at baseball, but also very good at entertaining. And we look for those guys that have the right cultural fit. Can you fit in? Do you understand that you're gonna sign more autographs than you'd sign anywhere else? Do you know that every night fans are gonna come in from over 30 states and drive hours to come see you play and entertain? And when we share that message with the guys, it's very clear what they're a part of and they're bought in. You got the most entertaining team in baseball and the best team in baseball. We can do a lot more. We have a lot more freedom entertainment wise and celebration wise. And it kind of frees us up to do a lot more things than they can like in the CPL playing competition that's out of, you know, within our organization. My favorite entertainment bit that we've did so far is the Baywatch video that we made. So we had a uh, Savannah Banana swim trunks made. They were cut off about halfway up our thigh. We we're shirtless with sunscreen and oil over, all over our bodies running up and down Tybee in slow motion for a Baywatch video that we made. Every day, we ask ourselves, how do we create the greatest show in sports and deliver the best possible fan experience? And so what does that look like? Four years ago, we started testing a brand new game called Banana Ball. There are nine rules of Banana Ball, and each one is to make the game either more exciting, more fun, or faster. So the first rule is every inning counts. So if you win the inning, you get a point. Two hour time limit is a huge rule. And so as soon as we say, all right, time to play ball, I yell, start the clock. And literally two hours, 159, and it just goes down. And people are watching the clock, and they know by nine o'clock, the game's over. Batters can't step out of the batter's box. If you step out, it's a strike. There's no bunting, because bunting sucks. If you bunt, you're thrown out of the game. Batters can steal first. There are no walks. It's now called the sprint. There's a showdown if the game is tied. Pitcher versus hitter, and there's one fielder, and the hitter has to score. There are no mound visits. Fans catch a foul ball, it's an out. You're out. So when we look in the future, we're gonna continue every day to do things that we've never done before on a field. Hopefully wow our fans and make the game as fun as humanly possible. I would be shocked if we're not playing all over the world and selling out major league stadiums and playing places you never imagine a baseball team to play. Because that sounds like fun. Coming up next. Well, she's young, but she cuts hair like a pro. An eight-year-old is blazing a trail at the barber shop in North Philadelphia. Well, she's young, but she cuts hair like a pro. An eight-year-old is blazing a trail at the barber shop in North Philadelphia. When I was seven years old, I first started cutting hair. I wanted to cut hair to make money so I can buy my own things. One day, I see her standing on stage teaching people. She has potential to be as great as she wants to be. I want to also be a surgeon and own my own barber shop. She's been kind of obsessed with it since I met her and uh, focused and driven. It's teaching her life skills. She's learning how to relate to people, how to be empathetic, you know, how to listen. It helps with focusing, just a lot of different things. Hi, my name is Miss J, known as the World's Youngest Female Barber, and this is my hustle. My mom enrolled my brother in a barber orientation, and he said he didn't want to do it. So one day I come home from school, and I see my mom looking at some posts on Insta from the barber orientation. And I asked, what is this? And she told me it was barbering. And in my mind, I'm like, what's barbering? And she says, going to the hair salon for men. I explained to her what it was in short, and she said, well, mom, if he doesn't want to do it, I'll give it a go. And we enrolled in the course. Nije was the youngest in the class and the only girl. So, you know, we just kind of took it week by week to see if her interest would wane. That didn't happen. It increased. She wasn't intimidated at all. She was eager to learn. Girl barbers, we do it too. I grew up with all brothers, so it wasn't hard for me to acclimate to an all-male designed area. We've developed a cadre of barbers that we can count on for support. So whenever they have opportunities, they'll reach out to us and we'll take full advantage. 
Well, there was actually a salon. It was here, and the lady that owned the salon came in, and she said there was a little girl next door, and she's interested in learning how to cut hair. And she asked, could I come over there and show her a few things? And the rest is history. I'm going to the school to help kids with their hair. It's a back to school event. We're doing it for free. I'm cutting three heads today, and I'm very excited. I'm Dr. Newton, I'm the principal here at Warner Elementary, and my kids are really, really excited about coming back to school. What we did today was pretty much open up free haircuts for all our students to get ready for school on Monday. When I first came to Warner, there were a lot of behavior issues that was going on in our, in our school, but since you know I opened up the barbershop and allowed our students to come together, read books, and I just noticed that when kids look good, they act good and they feel good. So I just started using it as a way to build a relationship with my students. For me, it's calming. You can like draw into the head, like a person in the back of the head. And it's fun because you can be creative, dye the hair. I just love the fact that she's young, she's energetic, and she's passionate about giving back to the community and helping others. Um, to me, that's how we change the world. Okay, so this is my setup here, and before I would start the haircut, I would clean the clippers off. Just one tiny germ can fix somebody else. And you always want to stay clean for yourself and your client and safety. Safety is the most important thing about barbering. So you just spray that, and then you just want to dust the clippers off before you cut and after the cut. So the next step is I would drape the patient with these disposable capes. And then here, I put a guard on. You don't always have to put a guard on. And then here's the duster, where you would dust the client off when she or he has hair on their neck or sometimes they'll scratch. Here are the shape up clippers. The shape up clippers are for the hairline and you wanna start in the middle of the peak. And I also have a brush right here too to brush the hair down. So yeah, that's pretty much my setup. When I'm getting my hair done braided or something, I'm pretty bored and I'm just sitting in the chair doing nothing and I'd rather be watching something right now or reading a book. I don't want it, my barbershop to be ordinary. I want my barbershop to be cool and kid friendly. I want it to be a big barbershop with a big TV, video games you can play while you're waiting. I'm thinking about making it big, maybe alien themed, LED lights, and just a big old seat. You know the saying, if you enjoy what you're doing, you never work a day in your life. So you, you kind of have to enjoy what you're doing because you do have to put in a lot of hours.